Complex News, I'm Perry Simpson here in Los Angeles, California. Recently, Complex denoted the greatest producer alive for 2019, and that guy in front of me is Mad Lib. Mad Lib, my brother, how you feeling, man? Brother, how you doing? I'm good, man. First and foremost, how did it feel to be considered greatest producer alive for 2019 by Complex? Oh, that's an honor, you know, because yes. my, my stuff's mainly underground, so for people to really get my stuff like that, it's, it's cool, man, you know what I mean? Yeah, doing, your, doing the research, it was, uh, you would always kind of say, like, you kind of shy away from the popular music. You don't want to necessarily be considered mainstream. Yeah. So for a publication to be like, you're the greatest producer alive, was it kind of tough to... Because there really ain't one, but I'm glad they acknowledge me, you know what I mean? Yeah. Greatest to me is Dilla, but, right. you know, that's, that's, that's my musical cousins. First and foremost, your career has been very prolific, over 60 projects, but your most recent projects with Freddie Gibbs has been able to transcend and introduce you to an entirely new audience. So what do you think about that collaboration that's helped you like transcend? Because he has a different crowd. Like, you know, he kind of does trap music. I also do trap music. But I'm known for whatever y'all know me for. Right. But uh, it's just the mesh of my weird underground world and his gangster hood stuff, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So I treated it like Compton Most Wanted. They used like raw loops and crazy storytelling and yeah. stuff. You were a big fan of DJ Quick and yeah. those tapes, and you were very much, you were here, born in Oxnard, so grew up in Oxnard, so you were kind of close to the movement of like the NWA and the California music. Right, was DJ out. Pooh was the first dude that helped me out. You know? Really? DJ Pooh and DJ Broadway and Alcoholics, Yeah. King T. Yeah. And do some of those uh, those influences that you learned early on, do you still use that in your music too? Oh yeah. yeah, I always do new stuff, but I keep the old, you know what I mean? Definitely. I may move somewhere else, but I'm still do what I always used to do. Right. You and Freddie Gibbs initially uh, connected in 2011. What was it about him that kind of drew you to him? Uh, he's just funny. Really? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Keep you laughing. Some hood stuff, you know what I mean? He's like one of my cousins. My co you know, I have my family like that, you know what right, I mean? Right, right. So yeah, I relate to it. So whenever you collab with somebody, you kind of have to mesh with them on a yeah. personal level before they Because usually I just send music out. I don't really get with the artists, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So it takes a special person for me to come out the studio. I can and, imagine. You know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. In 2013, you compared Freddie Gibbs to Tupac, but more in the sense of like his duality. He can talk the gangster rap, but he can also do other things. So do you still agree with that comparison? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Two different people, but I, that's who I would compare them to. You know what I mean? Right. I, you know, Tupac's the greatest, but of course. I mean, uh, of course. When you two initially started collaborating, it was just simply EPs and, and shorter projects. As the as the uh, relationship grew, it's more albums and longer projects. Well, it was it was just we were recording a bunch of music, and the EPs came out first. Really? I mean, we had albums done before. So it's just that's what y'all decided to yeah, put out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So why why initially just a, such a small sample size? Just to see if people would like it, you know what I mean? I just do what I feel, but we wanted to see if it would catch on and, and it worked, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, in 2014, when Pinata was released, it was initially supposed to be titled Cocaine Pinata. And as Freddie Gibbs put it, he was still very much in that world, still, still, you know, still doing certain activities. Whenever you're creating, you're making music and you're making beats, were you trying to fit the aesthetic to his lifestyle or was he more so trying to fit into yours? Uh, the first album, it was more like I just did whatever and he just talked crazy. The second album, I tried, I tried to, you know, come more where he's at mm -hmm. and, he, and, you know, let him shine more. And I made the beats more minimal, right. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. A lot imagine. of people accuse me for looping, but my name is Loop Digger. You know, Ooh. I grew up on RZA, Prince Paul. You know, that's what hip hop's based on, if, exactly. you, if you know your history, you know, from the old school. So. Right. Throughout your career, you've seen different versions and different iterations of music. Yeah. How do you adjust to the shift? Where I you, like it all. Like I it mean, all. I got stuff like everybody. I do stuff like the Migos. I do stuff yeah. like Sun Ra, whatever, you know? Right. Um, Freddie has a lot of Coke bars, and even the zebra yeah. imagery, it was a homage to that type of lifestyle. Whenever Pusha T was linked up on Palm Olive, it would seem to be the perfect person to collaborate for that record. Yeah. How did that come about? I was surprised like everybody else, really? you know what I mean? Gibbs has a relationship with him, and I didn't even think he was going to get him on it, but yeah. he just sent the song to me, and I was, yeah. Did you expect him to black out the way that he did? Nah. He just hit me up. We about to work right now. Really? Yeah. Can you talk more about that? Is it? Uh, we just sending music right now. You know? yeah. yeah. Would a collaborative album be something you would love to do with Pusha T? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to do that album with Pusha When you did Bandana, what do you feel like it provided the game that the game was missing? Uh, we don't really even think about it like that. We just right. try to create good music, you know? I don't, I don't try to do music to be the best. I just try to make 
good music that I would sit and listen to. And yeah. If I like it, it comes out, you know what I mean? Right. We don't overthink things, we just record. You just know? record, yeah, yeah. A lot of times, there were stories about how you don't like necessarily being in the studio with people. You yeah. kind of just go to work. There was even stories, you don't really sleep. You just go like three or four days without sleeping. Is that still true? <laughs> it's my third day, you know yeah. Like right now is your third day not sleeping. Yeah. I mean, y'all, I'm late because I couldn't get off the drum machine, you know what I mean? Okay, so break it down to me. How do you go so roughly 72 hours without sleeping and you're just making music? Uh, you just in, just in the zone? Just making music, yeah. It's kind of like meditation. Yeah. Like people do yoga and all that type of stuff. Right. Like I'll zone out and then it'll be a day later, you know what I mean? Like, really? It's weird. I think it's spirits or something. I don't want to scare people. When Freddie Gibbs went through his turbulent time overseas and he yeah, was arrested, yeah, was he mentioned that he was literally listening to your beats while he was being handcuffed. Mm -hmm. And the beats resonated with him so much that even when he was locked up, he couldn't have access to the speakers, but the beats were continuously playing in his head and he was able to write a lot of his raps to it. Where were you when you initially heard the news and were you ever concerned that he wasn't coming home? Oh yeah, I didn't think we were gonna have this album done. Really? Um, yeah, I was in the studio like, like I am now. I wasn't, you know, when I heard the news, I just called him every day I could and helped him out and, right. you know. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think he was gonna get out. I knew he didn't do it, but everybody was acting like he did it. Right. Now everybody's all cool with him now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted him to be able to come back, you know? He just had his baby and all that, you yeah. know what I mean? So, yeah. and I know he's innocent, he's a good dude, right. you know what I mean? But right. they try to portray his music as like, like he's like that. You know? Of course. Yeah. Did that bother you? They played you? it in court and they were like, oh, that's what you do? Like, you know? Wow. <laughs> like, oh, wow. You know, like, you know how they great. do us. Yes, of, you know, course. of course. Yeah, does it does that leave you conflicted at all? That like your art can be turned against you. We've seen that done with nah, I believe that's, the C murder that's trial. Being black, I guess yeah. that's just being black. That happens with sure. everything. You know, unfortunately, yeah. in 2016, you said sometimes you don't want to hear rap. Sometimes you want to hear the beats. Tell stories with beats. Bandana is about to be released with just purely an instrumental. Yeah, I can't even listen to that. You can't listen to Bandana. Anymore? I can't listen to four minute beats just going on and on. This is tired. Yeah, right? I can't do that. Like, really? Man. Why don't you like to listen to your own music? Is it just being too critical of yourself? No, I just do stuff and move on. Really? Just keep moving. Yeah. Okay. So does it does it get conflicting for you when fans come up to you and be like, "Yo, I loved your tape from"? Oh yeah. Yeah. My shows are kind of yeah. People confused because they expecting Quasimodo and, yeah. and I'm just playing crazy stuff. Like, yeah. yeah, all the stuff I grew up on or you mentioned new unreleased stuff or right. whatever. Like. You mentioned Quasimodo. You have a rap career. How does that help you whenever you're crafting uh, beats for rappers? That's yeah. that's why I can visualize. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I used to rap. Right. I wasn't great or nothing, but I, I know how to. Me and Dylan know how to mm -hmm. be a trumpet on the beat. You know right. what I mean? Like, yeah. Even you would say you would change your voice up. Cause you didn't really like your voice. <laughs> well, well, I don't rap anymore. It did, cause you just didn't like your voice. Yeah, no. Yeah. Nah. Nah, I get it. I get it, man. I didn't have much to say. Either. That was mainly a beat, dude. You had this another quote that also stood out to me. Uh, Niggas be sleeping, thinking they need all this gear. You created one of one of your most beloved songs, Raid, on a portable turntable, a tape deck, and an SP three hundred three for a bandana. It's alleged that you made all the beats on an iPad. One, is that true? Yeah, but the last. Uh, seven, eight years, everything been iPad. On an iPad? Yeah, I never had great equipment. I mm -hmm. always used low budget stuff. Right. You know, I'm down with like Lion Lotus, Ross G, all those type yeah. of dudes, and we keep it minimal. So, so you said for the past seven to eight years, it's strictly on an iPad. When Maybe have, longer. Like, really? people thinking bandanas just, oh, them beats sound weird, because yeah. <laughs> I've been doing this, but I don't even tell people. Really? So, so when artists, Come and see you work, and they see you working off. They don't see me work. They don't see you work, nah, so it's still nobody, all nobody would have seen me work but my kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dilla, I used to hang with Dilla, but you know. yeah. But just the iPad, that's that's incredible. Nah, that's the best piece of equipment you can have. Really? Yeah. That's you don't really even need a studio anymore. Um, during the early 2010s, you and Kanye linked up for several sessions before uh, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy came out. You gave him some beats. How were those sessions like whenever you were linking up with Kanye? It was crazy. I was sitting next to the Kardashians. <laughs> like, <laughs> really? <laughs> the Elder Bars right here. And, you know, <laughs> me and Elder Bars talking about doing an album and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of those beats you, you did ended up becoming uh, No More Parties in LA that featured Kanye West and Kendrick Lamar. He was 10 years old, too. That beat was 10 years old? Yeah. Really? 
and it was just, were you shocked when it initially came out? Nah, because I try to do timeless music when it, so it could come out anytime. Like, yeah. You, know I mean? you mentioned on Hot 97 that him, that, that wasn't the only song that Ye and Kendrick recorded on oh, your beats. <laughs> they did like 30 minutes of stuff. Like, really? Just going back and forth, going crazy. Like, hey. I heard it, somebody played it on the phone, but I haven't actually. Like, but you haven't heard like the actual <laughs> snippet. Are you dying to hear those yeah, records? Yeah, they were going off too. Like, yeah. Do you, I do my beat tapes like one minute beats and they would just one new on that one, that one, that one. It was crazy. Really? So would you sign off if Kanye came up to you and was like, yo, I want to release this they as, as a yeah, yeah, Why don't you think they do Same it? Same with Mac Miller, but it ain't gonna yeah. happen. It ain't gonna happen. Man. So no more parties in LA. You said the beat was over 10 years old. Freddie mm -hmm. Gibbs also recorded a track called Cocaine Parties in LA. Do you know which track was recorded first? Uh no, I don't. No. I know which one I like better though. That was my next question. I was afraid you were gonna answer that. I ain't gonna answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but back to Gibbs specifically, in what ways has the process been similar with your collaboration with him and your collaboration with MF Doom and Jay Dilla? I think me and Gibbs hung out longer. We had more time to hang out, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. We went around the whole world a couple times together and all that. How was your collaborations with Dilla? How, how were those times? Like, I'm sure that's something you hold yeah. on to that's and cherish. Best a lot. time of my life, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. He's just like me, but deeper. Right. You know what I mean? Are those are those tracks tough to listen to at all? Cause you, I'm sure you miss your friend. Uh, that keeps him alive. You know what I mean? Bumping yeah. stuff, turn it up. Right. There's a fan made collaboration uh -oh. titled Otis Benjamin, uh -oh. and it's Andre 3000's best verses. Vocals all oh. offbeat. <laughs> so you heard it. <laughs> yeah. Would you ever be open to working Hell with Andre 3000? Yeah. Hell yeah. I'm gonna make that shit way better than that. That was like, yeah, that was. Really? Yeah, really. Uh, we'll yeah. do it right. Andre, Andre recently did an interview, uh, I believe late last year with Rick Rubin. He kind of talked about the, the issues he's had kind of getting back into the game. Yeah. How would you help him get back into the game? I mean, he game? can do a flute album with me if you want. You know Just a whole flute album? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Pied Piper and the beat conductor. You know what I mean? I'm not mad at it, man. I'm not mad at it. I think, I think the streets need a mad lib and Andre 3000 take. That would be incredible. Complex dubs you the greatest producer alive for 2019. So I gotta congratulate That's great. you once Thank again. Thank you guys for that. so much. No problem at all, man. Well deserved. For Complex News, I'm Pierce Simpson. Man, live. My brother, Peace. Peace. appreciate you. Thank you.